Okay, we've been looking at the fact that when you're a saved person, you have Jesus. He is your living hope. We've been going through 1 Peter. And for about the last 13 weeks, we've been doing this for the summer quarter. And uh, we began by saying, hey, Jesus is our living hope when we just don't fit in. Ever feel like that? You just don't fit in? We are like the square peg trying to fit into a round hole. It says, because you've been chosen, you've been elected, you've been foreknown, God sets you apart to be different than the rest of the world. You don't fit in. He went on to say, one of the things that's going to happen is you need Jesus as your living hope when you're tested by fire. You know, there used to be a, a saying that God has a wonderful plan for your life. Well, he does ultimately. But getting to the ultimate end of your place in heaven, there may be a little temptations, trials, problems, and difficulties in life along the way. And along that path where you're being tempted by and tested by fire, Jesus is your living hope. We looked at that. Then we looked at that section in the book of 1 Peter where it says, Jesus is your living hope when you're pressured to conform. We live in a world that is trying to push us into its jello mold so that we'll pop out like it. But we are not like that. We've been called to be different, to stand out in the crowd. Jesus is our living hope when you need to know who you really are. The world will tell you who they think you are, but I know who I am. And the world is so doggone confused. They don't know who they are, so why should they be telling me who I am? In fact, we got, we got politicians that can't tell the difference between a man and a woman. They can't even define a woman. Are you kidding me? They can't define a man. The most hilarious thing I've seen lately is that men give birth to babies. Are you kidding me? How should they tell me who I am? No, when you need to know who you really are, you go to the source of who made you, and that's God, and he'll tell you who you really are. He'll tell you who you really are. Listen, Jesus is our living hope when you have conflict. You will have conflict. It's guaranteed because we live in a world that is full of conflict. Jesus is your living hope when your boss is in your face. I remember that? It talked about the masters and servants. Yeah, when, when your boss is in your face, how to react. Jesus is our living hope. He'll give you what you need to react. Jesus is a, your living hope when your marriage lacks its luster. You see, in the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says, those who marry will have trouble in this world. It's not might or may, will have trouble. Most people think that when they get married, they're going to divide their problems in half. No, when you got married, you doubled your problems. And so what you need is Jesus in your life because Jesus is our living hope when the marriage lacks its luster. Jesus is our living hope when good people suffer. And we dealt with that. When good people suffer, Jesus is our living hope. Then we looked at the fact that sometimes the battle is just outside your door. Uh, you get up and everything's wonderful and you pray, thank you, Lord, for all the blessings in your day and all of that. And then you say, and I'm now about to put my feet on the ground as I get out of bed and the battle is on. And he's saying, hey, when Jesus, Jesus is your living hope, when you're battling things in your life, he goes on, he says, Jesus is your living hope when he's called you to suffer. It's one thing to say, hey, those people in third world countries, they're suffering and I'm sure glad I'm not called to suffer, but what happens when he calls you to suffer for his name? The answer is Jesus is our living hope. That's what this whole book is about. Jesus is our living hope. Last time that I was with you two weeks ago, we looked at Jesus is our living hope when you need a good minister. And uh, we went down through that passage, and today it is Jesus is our living hope when we just need to grow up. <clears throat> you know, when I was a seminary professor and I was teaching my class, I could find out if they learned anything. I gave them a test, right? Uh, I, I actually, we had a, a lab, and in the lab, they had to do what we were teaching in class, so they actually had to do it. And part of it was I was teaching a Christian education course, how to teach, uh, how to do a small group. And so each one of the students would have to run the class and do the small group. I, I got immediate feedback of how they were doing it. In the pastorate, I don't get to do that. 
Wouldn't it be nice if I could give a quiz at the end of every sermon? I could do that. All right, I see some heads shaking yes until I do it. <laughs> yeah, what, what, what if it were like, hey, we're going to talk about sharing our faith today, and at the close, I want you to come up and share your faith. You say, wait, where's the exit? I'm looking for the doors. <laughs> you know you know what I'm saying? I got this guy up here. See this guy? He's pretending. He's pretending to be all growing up. He's pretending to be all grown up. He's not growing up. I find that in the church, there are people who have been Christians for years, decades. But on the inside, they're still spiritually immature. They've never grown up. They're like this little guy here, man. He's put on the clothes and acting like he's a growing up not. He's immature. He's shallow. You ask him to, to share something that God's doing in his life, and they'll talk about 20 years ago, God did this in my life. Well, what has God done lately? What verse have you memorized lately? What passage have you read lately? This week, I was with my sons the last two days. I went down to visit my sons and my grandsons to take four of my grandsons out for their birthday and took my other grandson and my, my sons and we all celebrated. But I stayed overnight and uh, I, I slept on the sofa because it's a house full of people already. So I'm sleeping on the sofa early in the morning, tiptoeing down the stairs, comes my daughter-in-law. She sneaks into the kitchen. She gets out her Bible. She gets out her journal. And she starts reading, turns on the music really softly to have that atmosphere while she's reading the Word of God. And she's journaling, my heart was so proud. My daughter-in-law has grown so much in her faith. She would be bursting out of those clothes. She'd be bursting out. Peter wants us all to just grow up in our faith. Just grow up. Just grow up. He wants us not to, not physically, he's not talking about physically, he's talking about spiritual maturity. And spiritual maturity, according to Peter, comes from clothing yourself. Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you, clothe yourself. You, you put this on. That's what my daughter-in-law was doing. She's coming down, creeping down the stairs. Don't want to disturb anybody else. Kind of remind me of Jesus. Jesus getting up early in the morning and tiptoeing out of the house when he was staying at Peter's place. You know, and his mother-in-law was there, Peter's mother-in-law. And he's, he's slipping out of the place and he goes to a, his own private place, solitary place, to pray. You clothe yourself. He says you clothe yourself. But what's he say you clothe yourself with? Number one, he says you clothe yourself with, with submission. You yield to what God wants for you. In fact, if you read this passage, it says young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. Now, many translations have changed that word older to the elder. To the elders, because it's the exact same term we looked at two weeks ago of the elder of the church. Remember when we, we talked about that, the elder? Yeah. And so, what he's saying, hey, listen, you submit to the pastor. What he's teaching, you submit to that and you practice and do that. I can remember the preacher that preached the same passage week one, week two, week three. The congregation has got a little concerned about this. Every week he's preaching the same, same chapter, okay? The same chapter. He's stuck on that same chapter. Four, five, six weeks later, still preaching that same chapter. Got to the end of the quarter. I mean, 12 weeks he'd been preaching the same chapter. He said, Pastor, you keep preaching the same sermon every week. He said, yep. He said, why are you doing that? He says, well, I'll move on to chapter two when you finally practice chapter one. Submissive. You apply it in your life. You clothe yourself 
with submission. Secondly, he says, with humility. With humility. Humility is an interesting thing. I believe humility is seeing yourself as you truly are. Pride is when you see yourself as bigger than you are. False humility is when you put yourself down. True humility is seeing yourself for who you truly are. Jesus was humble. In Philippians chapter 2, it says, even though he was in the form of God, even though he is God, he's got all the attributes of God, he humbled himself and he took upon him our humanity. He humbled himself and became obedient even unto death, the death of a cross. Jesus knew exactly who he was, that he was God, yet he, he humbled himself to take on our humanity, to go to the cross and die for our sins because he deemed us more valuable than himself. When a person is truly humble, they know exactly how great and how, how small they are at the same time, and they see other people more important than themselves. He says, you clothe yourself with this attitude that Christ had of being humble. He says, with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud and he gives grace to the humble. That moves me to the second thing. You need to Spiritually, you need, if you're going to grow spiritually, be spiritually mature, it comes from humbling yourself. Having mentioned humble twice, he hits it the third time. He says, humble yourself. So it's a command. You do this. You humble yourself. You see others more important than yourself, even though you know exactly who you are. He says, humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. You realize, oh my goodness, I only am who I am by the grace of Almighty God. So I see myself just as I am. I'm just a sinner saved by grace, called by God, chosen, foreknown. Those are the first few verses of, of this epistle. And he said, hey, I'm the one he selected uh, to bear his name, I'm to, I'm to give a, a reason of my hope to everyone who meets me. He, he goes, hey, I know who I am. I'm under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up. He might lift you up. It's not about me bragging about what I have done. It's about God saying, look at my servant. You see my servant? You see my servant? Humbling yourself is the way we grow spiritually. We grow spiritually. Third thing is freeing yourself, he says. This is what you need to do. You need to cast your anxieties on him. So I got this guy here. Does he look anxious? I hope he looks anxious. Right? He's worried. He's fretting. He's got these anxieties. And I don't know what it is that causes your worry, your fret, your anxiety. It could be finances, could be health, could be your children, could be your parents, could be, I don't know what it is. It causes you anxiety, worry, fret. This passage says you take all that, you identify what it is, you take it, and then you cast it. I like that. You throw it. You throw it on the Lord. <laughs> you just take it and say, whoo, there it is. Now, how do I do that? I do that in prayer. I go to the Lord and I pray and I say, Lord, this stuff is making me anxious in my spirit, in my heart. I'm worried. I'm fretting. I can't sleep. Whatever it is that's doing to you. I'm overeating because all I can do is worry and eat. And he says, no, I'm going to cast that on you, Lord. And I think sometimes we're pretty good at throwing it to the Lord. But then what we do is we kind of back up and take it again. <laughs> We don't leave it there. No, no, he says, no, 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 no. You've got to cast it on the Lord. Why? Because the Lord cares for you. He'll deal with it. He'll deal with it. You just say, Lord, I'm so worried about this physical thing that the doctor told me, but I'm just going to leave it with you. And, and when, when, when it comes back to haunt me, I'm going to say, ah! I know what I did with that. I gave that to the Lord. And you just put it right back there. Put it right back there. 
I call that changing the channel. Click, just change the channel. You see, my brother, I think I might have told you this, when I was young, he had me watch my very first horror movie, which was Frankenstein. Now, by today's standard, it's not very scary, but when I was about, you know, six, eight years old, that was pretty scary to me. And that night I was having a nightmare. And that nightmare it was, Frankenstein was in my nightmare. And, and so I kind of woke up and I said, Lord, I just got to change the channel. And in my mind, I changed my channel and said, I am going to think and dream about something else. I gave it to the Lord. He took it away. I went off to sleep. That's what you got to do. You give it to the Lord, and when it comes back, you say, well, no, no, i got to turn that channel again. You turn it again. You, you give it to the Lord. You make sure that the Lord has it. Why? Because he'll take it away. In fact, instead, this is what the Bible says in, in Philippians. It says, be anxious for nothing, but with prayer and supplication, make your request known to God. And here's what happens. When you cast that on the Lord, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind. So when you really give it over to the Lord and say, Lord, it's now your problem, not mine. He'll deal with it. But if you pick that thing back up, he say, oh, you Indian giver. I guess you can't say that anymore. I'm sorry. Um, Lord, I'm wrong. I took that back. You just tell them. It will free you when you really give it over to the Lord. Because his promise is, when you truly give it to me and don't take it back, I will give you peace. I will guard. Listen, the word is a military term. I will set up a post, a garrison of soldiers around your heart and around your mind so that you will have peace. You'll have peace. That's where maturity comes from. You're not an anxious Christian, you're a peaceful Christian. The next one is, hey, the spiritually mature become that by controlling themselves. you controlling yourself. He says, be self-controlled and alert. It would be great if we had an on and off switch for like our mouths. <laughs> Sometimes we like talk too much and we'll say to our spouse or someone, did I talk too much? And the other person being polite say, oh, no. <laughs> but you know by the way they say no, that may mean yes. Yeah, they're saying no, but their head is shaking, yes. No. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if we had a control, you know, like uh, on our feet, our hands, our minds, what we think about, if we could just turn it off, turn it off. Most guys can do that. Most gals don't. It's just the way God's wired us. The guy's got this place. They just throw the switch. They go to nothing zone. In the nothing zone, they think about nothing. And gals, gals will say to him, what are you thinking about? And he'll say, nothing. And she's thinking, you liar. And he's thinking, what's wrong with you? I, I just checked out. I'm in, my, I'm in my, my nothing space. Women, you wish you could do that. You've you got to wish you could do that. Because a woman's mind is constantly going, 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 until they fall asleep. And then I'll bet even in their sleep, they're dreaming. All right? But wouldn't it be great if there was an on and off switch for all of this so that I could self-control? i just go, whoop, okay. Whoop. i turn it off and on. He's saying, listen, you do. You do. God never commands us to do something we can't do. And so when he says, be controlled, self-controlled, you can self-control. You know, when it comes to the diet, you say, oh, I, can, I can't do this. I just can't stop eating this. Yes, you can. It doesn't matter what it is. I just can't stop thinking about this. Yes, you can. You can. God's never going to command us to do something we can't do. And here it says, be self-controlled. And then he says, be alert. The alert is to be on the lookout. Because that temptation is going to come. We're going to see that in a moment. Be self-controlled and alert because your enemy, the devil, he's prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He is looking for you. And you know what? He knows what your weakness is. 
So as he's, he's roaring around, he's looking for your weakness, and when he sees that, he hits your self-destruct button. You know, you can, you can give up just about anything in your life. You can. I gave up drinking some pop for two weeks. If I could do it, you can do it. It's true. It's true. Everybody gets tempted, and everybody has an area of temptation. You don't think the devil knows your area of temptation? That's why he says you've got to be self-controlled, and you've got to be alert, on the lookout, because he's going to push your button. And you know what happens when he pushes your button? You do that thing, and then when you do it, you know what? You feel so doggone miserable. Guilt sets in. I have not honored my Lord. I am guilty. I've just sinned against God. And, and then what do you do? You go to prayer and you feel so defeated. And you say, Lord, here I am again confessing the same sin. Forgive me, O Father. And the Father says, what do you mean again? <laughs> you see, the last time you confessed it, He forgave it. And He's not holding you accountable for it anymore. It's you that are feeling miserable. Because Jesus already paid for it all. All of it. And it's your guilt. But he's saying, listen, you want to stop that guilty feeling? You have self-control. Be on the lookout because he's going to push your button. And when that temptation comes, you say, Lord, I'm casting this upon you because I know he's pushing my buttons and I want you to help me, Lord, overcome this. Listen, he will. He will. You do not have to cave in. You can be self-controlled. The fifth thing he says, you have to assert yourself. Spiritually mature people are asserting themselves by resisting. They're giving resistance to the devil. They're giving resistance to their flesh and all of its evil impulses. They're resisting. He says, resist him, standing firm in the faith. Resist him. I'm reminded in the book of Hebrews, the Hebrew Christians were being persecuted. They're Jews who had converted to Christianity, and the Jewish community was persecuting them. So they felt, well, maybe it's just better to be a closet Christian. That's why the verse says, forsake not your assembling together with the other believers in Hebrews chapter 10. It was easier to not go to church and identify with them because if I go to church, they're going to know I'm going to church and they're going to persecute me. And so the persecution was pretty fierce because the verse says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. How far should I go resisting sin? How far should I go? To the point where I shed my blood. Ooh. See, it's costing you very little to resist sin in your life. It was costing them a lot. And he's talking about forsaking the assembling of yourself together with Christians. You, you come to, you got to be a part of the church no matter what, no matter what. He says, resist, resist him. Now, resist him standing firm in the faith. And here I got this soldier and he's got the shield of faith, the shield of faith. Without my faith, the shield, okay, I am going to be attacked in fact, in Ephesians, it talks about the fire darts of the devil, the arrow shooting at me. You take down the shield, and what do I got? Well, I got a breastplate still on, I got a helmet, but I'm very vulnerable. I got a, I got a belt of truth, I got my feet covered, but I got a lot of exposure. But with the shield of faith, my faith, the stronger you can get in your faith, the more mature you will become. So how do I get strong in my faith? I get into the Bible. I read the Bible. I pray. I share my faith with others. I, I, I serve and I love other people as, as God wants me to love them. Listen, when, when I'm doing all that, my, my faith grows and it grows and it grows. He says, because you know. Oh, here we go. He says, therefore, put on the full armor of God that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after having done everything, to stand. That's what he says, resist him, standing firm in the faith. Why? He says, there's no temptation, common, <clears throat> that is, <clears throat> there's no temptation that has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when, the, when, but when you are tempted, 
He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. I love that verse. He wants us to stand, standing firm, stand up. No matter what the temptation is coming, I got my shield of faith. I can stand up under it. I can. I can. Why? He says, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. He says, listen, the temptation that comes to you has come to everybody else who is a believer. That's why in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says, it is common to man. Every temptation that I have is common to you. Every temptation you have is common to me. Now, the features of that temptation are very unique. My temptations are mine and not yours, <laughs> right? Your temptations are yours and not mine, but there's a commonality there among them all. We are all tempted in all the same ways. And I have to assert to resist the temptation. That's what spiritually mature people do. They grow up. They learn that we're in a battle. The final thing here is you have to restore yourself. If you've been in a battle, you've been pretty beat up. <clears throat> I don't know if this car went through a battle or not, but it is pretty beat up. It is pretty beat up. He says, and the God of grace, God who gives his gifts, grace, and has called you to eternal glory in Christ Jesus. I remember I was eight years old when I got the call. Preacher made the invitation. I responded. He showed me in the Bible how God loved me, and I asked Jesus to come into my heart and save me as a child. And, and he says, the God who gave me eternal life, that God who gave that to me, he says, after you have suffered a little while, <laughs> there will be suffering along the journey of our Christian experience. After you have suffered a little while, he will himself restore. And I, I like that word restore. And you look at that car, it's a piece of junk. That's the way my life was without Jesus, but he restores me. Isn't that great? He restores you and he will make you strong firm and steadfast to him be the power forever and ever listen <clears throat> god is not done with me yet i am in the process of restoration and that process will be ended when i pass from this life to the next i will be glorified and i'm going to be everything god ever intended me to be i'll be glorified you too if you've been saved He's saying, well, listen, just grow up now. Start, start living like that now. Why would, you, why would you settle for less? Here's the conclusion. First Peter says, Christ is our living hope, and God just wants you to grow up. There you go. Just grow up. <laughs> Fill in those clothes. Be the man, the woman that God intends you to be. Then the real conclusion to the book comes, and I'm just going to read this. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, that would be the city of Rome, because he wasn't in Babylon. It's code name for Rome, because you don't want to say anything bad about Rome. He says, she who is in Babylon, chosen together with you. Oh, we're Christians in Babylon or in Rome and the Christians that he's writing to in Galatia, in the region of Galatia. He's saying, send, they send you greetings and so does my son Mark. Now Mark is the guy who's credited for writing the Gospel of Mark. He's with Peter. It is believed that Peter actually dictated the book of Mark to Mark who wrote it as his scribe, and though it's Peter's story, it's Mark is the scribe, so Mark gets credit for the book, even though Peter wrote it. Could be. But it is, he says, hey, listen, hey, Mark's here with me, and he sends his greetings, and then he says, greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace be to all of you who are in Christ Jesus. We don't practice that kissing, you know, part. We do the handshake. I'm glad we're back to the handshake. I was getting tired of the elbows. I was getting a little tired of the fist bumps. Our custom is saying, hey, you, you greet brothers and sisters in Christ. We've come to the end of 1 Peter. It's been a good study, amen? 
He says, so what do we learn? What do we take away today? What do we take away? I got one thing I want you to take away. God wants you to grow up in your faith. God wants you to grow up in your faith. Because Jesus is our living hope. God wants us to grow up. Let's pray. Father in heaven, work in us so that we grow in our faith and our knowledge of Christ. Not just in our heads, but in our hearts. That we love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. May it come out of us in a way of loving our neighbor as ourselves. In the name of Jesus, sharing what you've done in our lives with others so that they would want to have it too. That we might grow not just spiritually, but numerically too, Lord. And we might find others who come to Christ. They would get saved and baptized and join the church and turn around and grow and share their faith for others to do so. Bless in this way, I pray, O Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.